What we've built in Python is not a database management system. It's just an example of how SQL can be interpreted. But an actual database management system is much, much, much more complicated and has all of these different parts. There is a relational query processor that does SQL parsing. Then it does some rewriting to make that more optimal, runs some optimization on top, and then decides actually how to um, execute a query. So this whole thing we've replaced with just a few maps and filters, but usually requires much more thought in order to make it work. And that's only one piece. Database systems are designed for many different clients to communicate with it at the same time. And so it has to be the case that there's some communication manager and a piece of the system that handles concurrent communication to make sure that everybody sees a consistent view of the data. And then there are some other pieces over here and over here. The point is that there's lots more to learn about database management systems than the SQL language, but knowing the language helps you interact with them. So if you need to build an application that involves data storage, don't just use the Python code that we've distributed with the textbook. Instead, use a real database management system, but at least you'll know how to interact with it using a declarative language. Now, I've talked a lot about declarative languages, but let me tell you why they're important. One reason is that they allow for query planning in database management systems. So by saying what we want but not how to get it, it's uh, possible for the database management system to decide how to compute the result that we want and the manner in which the tables that you get out of a select statement are created by filtering and sorting and joining affects execution time, sometimes by a lot. So let's take an example of our first join that we ever performed. Select the parents of curly furred dogs, which is select parent from parents dogs where child equals name and fur equals curly. This SQL statement includes a join, a filtering where we have equality between two different columns, and also a filtering that really only applies to one column, the dog's fur column. So in our naive implementation of a SQL interpreter, here's what happens. You join all the rows of parents to all the rows of dogs, which gives you a number of rows that is this number times this number, so quadratically many if these have both the same amount of rows. Then we filter by child equals name and fur equals curly. There are other ways to compute the same result. We could, for instance, join only the rows of parents and dogs where child equals name. If child and name are unique, you can do this in linear time just by sorting both of them and walking through in sorted order, just like a set intersection. So that can eliminate many rows that you're not interested in in the joined result by taking advantage of the fact that you're just computing equality across two different columns. Then you could filter the result by fur equals curly. This gives the same answer, but potentially much faster. Or instead of using dogs in the join, you could filter it first by fur equals curly, then join the result with all the rows of parents, and at the end filter by child equals name. Or perhaps better yet, filter dogs by fur equals curly. Then again employ the trick where you join only rows of the result where the child equals the name by treating them as sorted sets. So a query planner in a database management system will consider these options and perhaps many more and decide among all the ways that I could compute the result, which one will probably be the fastest based on what we know about the tables involved. So how long they are, whether uh, elements are unique within a column, all this information is used to make good decisions. And that's only possible because we have a declarative language and the interpretation procedure is left up to the system.